Welcome back to Inside Look, an Inside Ambition segment where we take a deep dive into something that's happening here at Drexel. I'm Alexandra George. And before you click away to the next video of some other 20-year-old girl ranting alone in her bedroom, please make sure that you are subscribed to our YouTube channel and you're following our Instagram. And go ahead and hit that thumbs up button down below because today I have great news. We are finally talking about something that doesn't relate to the global pandemic we've all been suffering through the past 10 months. Oh, what's that? Ooh, maybe next week? Okay, okay, I get it. But everyone, take a deep breath, unclench your jaw, stop nibbling at your fingernails. It's just that every single aspect of society has been touched by this pandemic, so it's really hard to avoid talking about it. And I gotta ask, Miss Corona, how do you do it? I wish our show would go as viral as you. As you all know, or as you all should know, because you watch us on YouTube every single weekday, campus is reopening slash has kind of sort of already reopened. Today marks the rec center's re-reopening, and by now, move in to the res halls has been completed. Along with the reopening comes many recurring events or traditions unique to our university. Now you might be thinking, but like, what? I am here to tell you something extremely exciting. Something that I know you've all been waiting for since last January. Drexel Spirit Week is fast approaching and it culminates in homecoming. Okay, so maybe in the past this event hasn't exactly been the most anticipated, but this year we'll take what we can get, right? Especially considering that Drexel is not the school with the most school spirit. All factors considered, we were once rated the U.S.'s ugliest campus, we don't have a football team, and Half of the student population is too busy on co-op or studying abroad to care about mundane traditions like licking Mario's toe or storming main building or whatever kind of things college students do to build community. How am I supposed to know? The one tradition Drexel does have is homecoming. And this year it's more symbolic than ever considering this is the first time a lot of us have come back to campus in almost a year. Now let's take an inside look. We all sacrificed a lot in the year 2020 and we are continuing to miss out on traditions in 2021. However, Drexel's week-long winter tradition leading up to homecoming will run this year from February 1st to the 7th. And you guessed it, it will be a COVID safe event with plenty of virtual opportunities for everyone to get involved. This year during Spirit Week, Drexel students can sign up as individuals to represent their college or school in the competition. Someone was really working overtime planning the events this year as they include a homecoming bonfire, a virtual reality show, Quizzo, and a scavenger hunt. I mean, that sounds like a regular Tuesday night for me, but I'm sure it'll be exciting for y'all. The homecoming bonfire will take place on Monday, February 1st from 7 to 9 p.m. The bonfire will be socially distant. Ooh, does that mean they're just gonna have like logs all over campus six feet apart? Just like burning on their own? Hmm. The scavenger hunt will be on Tuesday, February 2nd from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and everyone is eligible to participate either virtually or in person. Students can complete tasks and challenges to earn points to get the top spot on the leaderboard and earn points for their academic college or school. Wednesday's event, the virtual variety show, from 8 to 9 p.m. is another opportunity for students to compete. You can submit a video up to 60 seconds long and tune in within the hour to vote for your favorite. 
Information on how to submit these videos can be found on the Homecoming website. Oh, also, I just want to mention, the virtual variety show is actually Drexel's birthday party for me, which wasn't exactly what I asked the birthday fairy for, but you know, you take what you can get in the midst of a global pandemic. February 4th is Quizzo, where many of the categories will be Philly or Drexel related. Be on the lookout for questions like, how hot is Mario on a scale from ice cold nymph to fire breathing dragon? I think we all know the answer to that one. What does President Fry's face actually look like? And what do you call that frozen treat that comes in flavors like cherry and blue raspberry? There's only one right answer. Those on the homecoming court have already been nominated. And I noticed none of you nominated me. It's my literal dream to be the royal dragon and have my photo taken with Mario. You all know how much I love him. Oh, how could you do this to me? So whoever is the royal dragon, we will find that out on Saturday the 6th. It won't be me, but it'll be someone. The selection will be determined by a student vote. The Royal Dragon will hold their title throughout the entire year and will receive a $500 scholarship. Whoa, $500 as top prize? That's a lot of money. That's almost as much as the second round of stimulus checks that we didn't receive. First and second place runners up will each receive a $250 scholarship. And then Sunday the 7th is the Super Bowl. I mean, you probably forgot it was even happening considering the Eagles have been out of the playoffs for so long. Remember that year they were actually good? By the way, rumor has it that a certain Drexel mascot makes a cameo in this year's Doritos commercial. If any of these homecoming events seem interesting to you, make sure you go RSVP on drexel.edu under the homecoming tab and enjoy. The return to campus and this week-long event might signify to the student body that there's a slight return to normalcy. Speaking of a return to normal, Drexel's dining services are now open as all first-year students back on campus are required to be on the dining plan. There will now be grab-and-go meals provided at Northside, and Urban is moving to the all-you-can-eat model. But I'm sorry to report, UC Veg is now just a salad bar. Come on, us herbivores need more than just leaves. Drexel's Rec Center is opening again today after months of being closed. There are restrictions put in place so that all you gym goers out there can exercise safely. The protocols in the Rec Center, of course, include masks required at all times while in the facility, plus there will be markers indicating six feet social distancing and all equipment must be wiped down after each use. Masked, clean equipment, and at least six feet? Sounds like proper bedroom protocol to me too. Speaking of bedroom action, locker rooms are closed for the time being, but single use bathrooms on the fitness floors will be available for use. Recreation staff will clean all fitness equipment every two hours and they will sanitize with cleaning agents verified for use against COVID-19. After all, Miss Coronavirus can only be defeated by the strongest of chemicals. All of these protocols are in accordance with city, state, and shout out to my main man, Joey B, federal guidelines. Oh, hush, Mario, you know you'll always be number one in my heart. You can sign up for time slots at the rec center a couple of days in advance but they will still be hosting plenty of virtual programming if you can't find a slot that works for you. So maybe exit your Zoom meeting, close that laptop, and head over to the rec center. Get those limbs moving! And after, treat yourself to some Wawa. You know, as a reward? Anyway, I hope all you dragons out there stay safe and healthy as we navigate a new phase here on campus this winter. How are you all feeling about the return to campus? Are you excited about homecoming? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, to stay up to date with all of our content, 
make sure you are following our Instagram at inside underscore ambition and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and we'll see you soon. Hey friends, welcome back to Inside Ambition. And thank you, dear, dear viewer, for tuning in to the main report, a weekly news rewind so that you don't get left behind. I'm Gabby Remo. Before I get started, I would like to humbly ask you, strongly encourage you, borderline peer pressure you into subscribing to our new YouTube channel. You should also like and share this video. And you could also check us out on Instagram at inside underscore ambition. You'll stay connected with our show and you'll never miss a Friday video date with me. And I know, I know you are totally a commitment person. I'm already having Pagoda engrave an infinity shaped promise ring with our initials on it. Now, we've got a lot to talk about today, friends. Let's waste no time and get right into it. As you should know, since we're BFFLs for life and you've watched every single episode of The Main Report, this segment is a Philly and Drexel news show. But I have to open up today's episode by taking it national. For our first story, let's talk about the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. On that Wednesday morning, a storm was brewing. Trump held a rally at the Ellipse, a park south of the White House. He addressed his supporters in what was called a Stop the Steal rally, denouncing the validity of the election and citing voter fraud once again. At this point, he had been urging his supporters for weeks to physically go to Washington and stop the certification of the election results. Trump called on his supporters to march on the U.S. Capitol, championing that he will be right alongside of them. And a big rush of people did just as he said. They started walking down Pennsylvania Avenue, headed for the Capitol while Congress was in session. The crowd overwhelmed Capitol Police and busted through barriers. It's almost like the Capitol's highest level of security was yellow caution tape and a Nerf gun. Trump finished his remarks and the crowd became increasingly aggressive. Mayor Bowser requested additional forces from Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy. Capitol Police Chief Sun spoke with the Commanding General of the DC National Guard, Major General William Walker, asking for more assistance. Now, police and riot gear attempted to push back the crowds, but as they moved towards the Senate terrorists, the insurrectionists smashed the door of the Capitol. Congress had to go into an emergency recess. And to make matters worse, the rioters took to social media, essentially digging their own grave. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, for goodness sakes, Pinterest, you name it. The social media sphere boomed with posts highlighting the illegal acts of all kinds. Individuals smashing statues, stealing Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi's mail and a laptop filled with confidential information, a huge national security threat. Viral photos of a man stealing the lectern, smiling and waving. So if you're following along, the rioters fought the police, broke into the building, rummaged through offices, stole and destroyed federal property, and forced congressional members into lockdown. But within minutes of this attack, the situation got darker. Many rioters were seen fully armed, some with guns, bulletproof vests, zip ties, and so much more. Crowds were seen on video chanting, hang Mike Pence. Now this came after Trump himself tweeted criticism of the vice president, stating, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected state of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they are asked to previously certify. 
USA demands the truth. This anger from Trump stems from Pence agreeing to fulfill his duty as the vice president and certify the election results, despite Trump's nonstop bid to overturn the election through invalidation. On a similar note, numerous social media posts were highlighted and flagged with one common theme, hurting or killing congressional members. Now, that to me was the most sickening part. Rioters had went to the Capitol with the sole intention of hurting those who are trying to protect the one thing our nation prides itself on, a fair democracy. And to an extent, they were successful. Five people passed away due to this insurrection. Brian Sicknick, an Air National Guardsman dreaming of becoming a police officer, he was beaten by rioters from the mob. He was struck in the head with a fire extinguisher. And then four of the Trump supporters in the mob died that day. Ashley Babbitt, an Air Force veteran, was killed by Capitol Police as she tried to climb through a broken window leading into the speaker's lobby. Kevin Greeson, Roseanne Boyland, Benjamin Phillips, they also died during this event. And you can't help but wonder, was this preventable? Did anyone see this coming? Frankly, social media was alerted long before this happened. And I'd say the country was given four years of notice, but I digress. Let's backtrack for a second. There were clues to this horrible event months before it happened. During the fall election season, the Department of Homeland Security constructed a threat assessment. Due to political polarization and the ongoing election season, the DHS feared individuals gathering together in large, committing acts of violence. Then, in late December, the NYPD sent a packet of material to the U.S. Capitol Police and the Washington Field Office of the FBI. Enclosed was information taken from various social media sites. The materials indicted the likeliness of violence against lawmakers when the presidential election results are certified on January 6, 2021. Two days before the election certification, the Metropolitan Police Department arrested Enrique Tarrio, the leader of the far-right Proud Boys group. He was charged with destruction of property and possession of high-capacity firearm magazines. But he was released the next day. They told him, skip town, go kick some rocks, leave Washington, essentially. On that same day, January 4th, U.S. Capitol Police Chief Sund requested from the House and Senate security officials that the D.C. National Guard be on standby. And the day before the raid, the FBI field office in Virginia issued an explicit warning that extremists have planned violence for the next day. This report included extremely troubling information, such as threats against specific members of Congress, an exchange of maps of the tunnel system underneath the Capitol, and organizational plans for different kinds of meetups. Despite that, because this information was not validated or analyzed, it wasn't enough for the National Guard or police to be deployed ahead of time. Now, this garnered a lot of criticism from the left side, considering the reaction to protesters during the Black Lives Matter movement. There was a lot to say about how exactly these rioters got as far as they did. There's speculation of it being an inside job, as video surfaced of a police officer waving in the crowd as they moved barricades out of the way. Heck, even the Philadelphia police are investigating one of their own detectives, Jennifer Guger, after she was in attendance at the rally. But either way, this event was many things. A security failure, an intelligence failure, you name it. But the insurrection at the Capitol left a permanent stain on the United States. But that, my friends, was January 6th. The insurrection at the Capitol. In the end, Democracy prevailed, and Joseph R. Biden was certified as the 46th president of the United States. On Inauguration Day, the Capitol, Washington, D.C., and all surrounding and major cities were placed on a high alert. This was due to the fear of more riots breaking out. 
The new president and the event was heavily guarded. The National Mall was lined with 200,000 flags representing all of those who could not attend. Lady Gaga, Jennifer Lopez, Katy Perry, and many other celebrities were at the special event. And may I add, the inauguration drip was real. The pantsuits, the coordination, not a clashed fit in sight. The pops of color, representing the vibrant potential for our new nation, representing how our black and white world was being painted in color, maybe, just maybe. But the real star of the show was the biggest meme of January. America's favorite democratic socialist, the guy who puts I care in Medicare for all. My humble main man, Bernard Sanders, this man was dripped out head to toe, sitting legs crossed on a federal folding chair, looking a little chilly, considering he had the coziest mans on. This Vermont maple man with more drip than a leaky faucet, he served looks. This photo of Bernardo Fernandez the Great has now become the icon of the week, as it has gone viral on social media. Even Drexel Admissions has joined in on the fun and posted a photo of Bernie and Mario. We love a crossover. But this is the start to the next four years. Regardless of your political position, continue to hold your leaders accountable. Keep that same energy and good luck, America. Alrighty, that was long, but hey, let's take it local. Speaking of national security, a little over a month ago, Drexel University's College of Engineering came up with a very neat invention. It's a new fabric coated with a special material called Mexine, and it's being tested in its capabilities of blocking electromagnetic waves and harmful radiation. This invention could be used for a variety of purposes, such as cybersecurity, with the material blocking contactless hacking by preventing the electromagnetic waves to get to the protected item. Other uses being cited are radiation shielding clothing, which could have many military uses. The research was actually supported by the US Department of Energy, who plans on further testing the material to try and remove a lot of that negative interference that still limits the fabric from its commercial use. However, for the time being, blocking electromagnetic radiation at a 99.9% .9 effective rate seems pretty good to me. For our next story, it's going to be a little close to home, like literally right across the street. In the first week of January, at a virtual conference of the Society of Historical Archaeology, a University of Pennsylvania professor, Dr. Robert Squealer, took it as an opportunity to bring in a relevant point after discussing accessibility to demand a physical presence in the Society's annual meeting and showed concern primarily over membership renewals. As he was reminded, there is a time and place for everything. As he was reminded that there is a time and place for everything, Dr. Scoiler pushed the claim of freedom of speech, and while raising his arm to show the infamous Nazi salute, included with an anti-Semitic pro-Nazism phrase. An extremely offensive and very unnecessary action like this might have cost him his livelihood, as far as we know. The University of Pennsylvania has canceled the professor's class, but students are still demanding for his complete termination. In a later email, he claimed his actions were simply made to evoke a point on cancel culture. And ironically, the one who's being canceled is now himself. Great to know that he's totally taking accountability for his deplorable actions. Now, I'd like to end today's episode with some quick feel-good news. Band-Aid up that trauma that I've brought up today. Let's start up with some Philly John. The Philadelphia Board of Trusts, after 151 years, has elected attorney Bernard Smalley, the first black president. As an agency that oversees 119 public charitable trusts, having this position be filled by a local West Philadelphian is symbolic. Smalley stated that he hopes to expand their ability to serve people from all walks of life in Philadelphia, as they should. 
Moving right along, Drexel's own Academy of Natural Sciences is opening its doors to a fun new exhibit, looking at the dinosaurs that came before the dinosaurs. The exhibit, called the Permian Monsters, Life Before the Dinosaurs, looks at a slew of fun and interesting creatures such as the Gorgonopsid and the Titanophonus, the Permian period. The time period from which these interesting animals came took place 299 to 251 million years ago, which is about how long last January feels at this point. Right, guys? Right? I can't do this anymore. The exhibit, okay, cool. We're almost done, we're almost done. Oh, heck yeah, we're almost done. The exhibit features fossils, scientifically accurate models, and interesting artwork, as well as fun interactive segments that will teach you more about dinosaurs than Jurassic Park ever could. The exhibit will only be around for a couple of months, so check it out soon, and ticket reservations are available on the Academy of Natural Sciences website. But that wraps up this week's episode of The Main Report. Before you say it, I will. I've already booked two tickets for you and I to go to the Drexel Dinosaur Exhibit. Please dress warm. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of The Main Report. Have a wonderful week, dragons, and I'll see you next time. dragons it's Paige here with your weekly thunder index where we discuss all things science storms stars and sustainability if you have not already make sure you are subscribed to our youtube channel and click that bell to get notified every time we have some new thunder per usual let's head into the next week of weather you could potentially see a mix of snow and rain later on into this weekend while the highs will reach about 46 degrees, the lows will plummet all the way to 19 degrees, causing some of this slush to freeze overnight. Be careful this weekend while driving and walking in the streets as it may be rather icy. Moving up in the sky and into the stars, let's recap on the last week of astrology and what it means for you. As we touched on in our last segment, the sun is currently in Aquarius and will be up until February 18th. During this cycle, we are motivated by our hunger for knowledge, experience, and innovation. Take a look around you. Innovation is everywhere right now. We are becoming more aware of what is outdated in our lives and striving for new perspective and new ways to do things. The class distinctions, structure, and order that Capricorn finds so appealing now seem far too rigid. The freedom of the individual is far too significant for us right now. You may start to notice that people are striving to free themselves of restrictions, limitations, and inhibitions that now feel constraining rather than safe. This cycle offers us an opportunity to focus on the practical issues in our current relationships and how to make them work in the real world. A dose of realism in our personal lives can help us feel more grounded and secure for the long run. The advice that I have for you right now is to take a deep and thoughtful look at the energies and the relationships that you surround yourself with. Notice what or who is helping you become more original and unique and independent rather than constraining you and restricting you and limiting you to certain ideals. Who do you want to be and what do you want to achieve? Are you surrounding yourself with the right people to accomplish these things? During this time, it is important to prioritize your needs and vocalize your ideas. On a piece of paper, write down five things that you want to internally accomplish during this year. So not necessarily a tangible goal, but something that you wanna work on within your own characteristics. For example, I am kind, I am motivated, I am organized. These are internal goals that you may want to align with yourself right now. Read these phrases every morning when you wake up and every night before you go to bed. The more you start to vocalize them, the more you will notice that they are true. You got this. Heading back down to earth and on the road to defeating climate change and saving our planet. Last Wednesday, President Joe Biden signed an executive order rejoining the U.S. into the Paris Climate Accord.
This was his first major action as promised to tackle global warming. Nearly every country in the world is a part of this Paris Agreement, a landmark non-binding accord among nations to reduce their carbon emissions. Now, let's talk about how this can actually affect you. Carbon, in its most basic form, is an element. In fact, it's the most common element for life on Earth. When we talk about carbon emissions, we're focusing specifically on carbon dioxide, or CO2. Long story short, CO2 is one of the greenhouse gases that absorbs radiation and helps prevent heat from escaping our atmosphere. This excess heat creates disrupted weather patterns, global higher averages in temperature, and other climate changes. Now the question is, is there anything you specifically can do to help solve this problem? And the answer is yes, by reducing your global footprint. From turning out the lights when you leave a room, to commuting via bus or bike, take a look at how you shop and make an effort to make more conscious, sustainable purchases. Buy products that make you happy, but buy products that will last. When you do shop, support companies that take a stand to reduce their own global footprint. By shopping with companies that care, you are showing the message that you care too. Now these are all easy, minuscule life changes that you can do which will create a huge impact on the global imprint that we have. It is extremely significant that we focus on this issue now before it is too late. Spread the word, tell your friends, and this year focus on your global footprint. And that is all of the science, storms, stars, and sustainability that I have for you this week. It is always thundering in Philadelphia. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week. Hey, it's Lizzie Friedman. This is Inside Ambition and you're on 34th and Art, where we talk all things arts and entertainment in and around Drexel University. This week we're talking life as an arts grad. Most art students have been enrolled in arts classes and following their passions their entire lives. It's not a phase, mom. Now it's a career. Drexel offers a variety of arts programs. I am a Westfall student and I'm receiving a Bachelor of Science in the Entertainment and Arts Management program, while other students in COAS, the College of Arts and Science, are receiving Bachelors of Arts degrees. My fellow 34th and Art writer, Kat Brady, is receiving a Bachelors of Arts in the Communications program, even though she's not a Westfall student or taking typical art classes. Why is that? Of course, Drexel has to do everything backwards. The Westfall College of Media Arts and Design, or COMAD, which the mad part is pretty fitting because of all of the grumpy architect students that stay up all night in the studio, offers a plethora of artistic programs like animation, film, product design, fashion design, I, of course, am partial to the Entertainment and Arts Management program, but there's so, so many more to choose from. Even custom design majors where you can choose your own path and make your own artistic adventure. But what happens when your four to five years are over? There is a stigma around pursuing a career in the arts that it's a dead end. But my good friend and 2020 Playwriting, screenwriting, graduate, Liv Schaup from school is here to prove him wrong. Hey Liv, thanks for joining me on 34th and Art. Well, thank you for having me, Lizzie. I'm so I'm so flattered that I, I get to be on this fun series. Yeah, as, as an old I'm bat. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> an old bat. <laughs> Just a year out of not even a year out of Drexel. But I'm so glad you're here with me as my good friend. Um and you can share your insights with fellow dragon community about life outside of Drexel as an arts grad. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I sure can. <laughs> um, so first things first, what all the Drexel kids want to know, where did you do your co-ops? I did my co-op. I only had one because I'm screenwriting and playwriting. Right. I had a six month and I was at Playpen. Um, which was an absolutely amazing experience. I basically worked with like the same three people in the office every day. And it was so 
just such a wonderful environment. However, I don't believe Playpen exists anymore due to some uh, controversy over the summer. I was supposed to work there again, and then due to some controversy over the summer, I no longer could. Uh, but all the people I worked with were like, are still amazing people that I still talk to as friends a lot. Um, oh, but I did do Drexel in LA. So I don't know if that counts. So when I was there, I did script coverage at a place called Cartel. And I worked at the Groundlings, uh, like the improv theater in LA that like a lot of SNL people have come from. And I got to meet like, I met John Lovitz. I met David Tennant. I met, I don't know, I'm forgetting her name, but she was Miss Briggs on iCarly and Jim Rash, who was the Dean from Community. Like I met so many cool people and it was, it was so fun. So that's where I did, that's where I did all my work. Amazing people everywhere. Lots of fun. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I'm glad you got that, that great experience. And I think that Drexel of all the things that it does and doesn't do, <laughs> definitely those real life experiences are quite helpful. Against all kind of negativity about like pursuing an arts degree and doing what you're really passionate in, what has kept, had kept you motivated and continues to keep you motivated uh, to keep creating art and doing all the fun things that you love to do. I think to a degree, it's just like knowing that, that that's what I'm good at. Like that, that's writing's what I'm good at. Comedy is what I'm good at. And I know there's an implication that like sometimes the arts feel kind of useless, but I haven't found that as much, especially like, especially like comedy is definitely not taken super seriously. I had been very, very, very studious in high school. Um, straight A's, all the APs I could take, very, like, <laughs> I had to stop taking AP uh, math classes because I would start getting nauseous and cry during tests because I was so scared of not getting an A um, that, the, that the teacher was like, stop, stop taking this, don't take this. Um, and sort of the feeling of like, oh, I went into something creative and goofy and all of a sudden feeling like, well, I guess I'm not smart anymore. And sort of being treated sometimes like I wasn't as smart. I had roommates at multiple times that were in like biology and would always say to me like, well, your homework's easy, you just write jokes. And I was like, yeah, but you can't write a joke. <laughs> like, First of all, no, I have like four papers a week to do, right. but also can you write a joke? You're not funny. Um, <laughs> you write science reports. What is that gonna do for the world? <laughs> exactly. And I have to proofread them <laughs> and they're not good. Um, <laughs> but yeah I think I am just also surrounded by people that are in the arts so the stigma has sort of really not applied to me in a very long time it didn't it didn't feel like a waste of time it's it's hard now because what can I do right. but um I think that the arts are necessary and they're not treated as such uh so I, just, I think I just ignore the stigma around it at this point because I'm like, no, they are. I know they are. And I know this is what I do. So whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Go watch The Office for the seventh time and tell me that the arts don't matter to you. <laughs> um, Very true. Yeah, I think that's the great outlook on it. I definitely relate. As, like if you feel like you're good at it and it's what brings you joy, as Maria Kondo would say, if it sparks joy, you got to do it, you know? <laughs> I mean, the screenwriting, playwriting community and just the Westfall community in general is so like while it's very large and like super multifaceted I feel like it's also super small like I know a bunch of people all scattered around and it's like you you find out about things and like I'm I'm in a different program than you but like I know a bunch of people in your in your former program and like yeah and I think it's like it's great to see us all kind of succeed in our own like different sectors of the arts and yeah and, and how we, we work grow. together a lot too yeah that's yeah that's always the, my favorite thing it's one of the luckiest things I've had was getting to work with so many entertainment arts management majors so many film majors so many music industry majors like it all just sort of was able to to coalesce um into just even just from having friends from the different majors into like being able to work on so many senior projects, being able to collaborate so, for so many classes, has just been a very lucky experience. Very, yeah. very lucky. 
what are you up to now that you're out of school? <laughs> I know that's a jarring question, but. <laughs> I always like to start this explanation with, um, so I graduated in March. I graduated a term early. My last class ever uh, was my Arthurian legend class where we learned about old English and King Arthur. It's like March 12th or whatever. And I'm like getting out of class. I get a picture in front of Mario. And I say to Tyler, who's in the class with me, I was like, let's go get a McFlurry. So we walked to go get a McFlurry. And then I was like, oh, I have a production meeting because Laramie Project, which I'm assistant directing with my great friend Lizzie, um, starts next term. And like we're in the production meeting and we get the email that the first half of the next term is online. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> like literally the day I stopped being in college. So it went from, and I've talked about this because I have a lot of other friends that are like this. You sort of had all these connections and you had the feeling that things were going, this, things were set up really well for you and they immediately disappeared. I was able, obviously like the show came back in a way. A um, different way. <laughs> I was offered a position to be a TA for the TV series writing class. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time I was like, oh my God, is that going to go away? Is my internship at Playpen going to go away? It was like, oh my God, I lost everything. And it all came back to a degree, which was nice. So like what I'm doing right now is I'm working on Essential, which is an original show, original piece that is replacing the show we were going to work on uh, last May. And I'm still uh, a teaching assistant. That's fun. So I'm still doing that apparently. Um, and like, it's weird because I do say I'm unemployed, but I am spending like 15 hours a week doing the theater stuff. I just don't get paid for most of it, mm -hmm. which is expected, uh, honestly, at this point and in this climate. Yeah. But basically all I've been doing is that and then trying to like, and dyeing my hair a lot and trying to figure out like what other things make me happy. Like I've played a lot of video games and now I'm applying to like smaller game studios just to see like, hmm, let's like, let's just see. There's just not a lot of things relevant to me to apply for. And once you've been like a year out of college and you haven't had the validation that you had of grades, um, at least grades were big for me. I only got two Bs in college and one of them was photography it's all of a sudden it's like, do I remember how to do anything? Am I good at anything? I guess what I'm doing right now is like trying to not drown in self-doubt um, and, and still work on creative stuff. And I'm very lucky to still have these projects going on. Yeah. Um, so I am, when I say I'm not employed, people are like, well, you are, you're just more volunteering. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you know, manifesting 2021. Yeah. find something in field work for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's a really positive outlook on it. Do you have any advice for fellow playwrights that might still be in school or still working on their way? Uh, hmm. Well, I will start with for the for the non male identifying students. If the males in the major aren't respecting you do not respect them either. Um, try to kill it with kindness as much as you can. In my experience, it doesn't work for a lot of them. So just give it back. Literally, I was told, God, in my like, freshman year screenwriting class, one of the students was like, you only get A's because the professor thinks you're pretty. And so I went to the professor and he was like, did he actually say that? To so to a degree, don't be afraid to take issues like that to professors I would say, especially in the arts, 90% of the time, they will take it seriously. I ended up, after graduating, reporting a lot of incidents that had occurred in my time at Drexel, and all of the responses were like, we're sorry we didn't create an energy that, was, that you felt safe telling us then. We wish you told us then. Uh, so tell them then. <laughs> if something makes you feel uncomfortable, if something feels wrong, tell your professors, tell your friends. Uh, just do what you can to create a support system. And that also includes if a professor makes you uncomfortable, tell the department head. Uh, tell, tell on people, snitch. Like, honestly, snitch. Uh, it's not snitching when it's for your safety. Um, not everyone's going to get your style. That doesn't mean you're doing a bad job. There are going to be professors that don't get your style. 
and you will have to decide what's more important, being true to myself or getting an A. And that is up to you. Make friends, work with people outside of your major. I would not, I would not have nearly the amount of like resume or the amount of productions under my belt had I not made friends with people in entertainment and arts management, people in film. It also just helps you as someone who communicates. Like it helps you be way better at communicating and working with people, which carries over into jobs that aren't in field because you're going to get a job that's not in field at some point. But if you worked with, if you play nice with others, uh, you're much more likely to get it. Networking is dumb. Just be nice to people. (laughs) (laughs) That's like super anti-Drexel, but like very true. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's Don't take all... any crap. Yeah, don't take any crap. Never from no one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that's all really, really amazing, helpful advice that everyone should take into consideration. Well, thank you so much for being here and talking about your experiences and all of your lovely anecdotes. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's always, I always like to talk period. Um, And I also like to talk just about about my experience, try to help other people, if not just to be like, this was my experience, it might be different from yours. But like, thank you so much for having me. It was really great to get to talk about this. Yeah, well, live from school. (laughs) Thanks again. Thank you. See, life after art school doesn't mean you have to be a starving artist. It's important to remember to do what you love and what truly moves you. I think Drexel does a pretty good job of preparing us for the real world. Although I don't really like that saying because what world am I living in now then? Regardless, there are so many opportunities upon graduation. Some people work in their field, some people work in another field, some continue to go to school. Even Westfall offers eight different graduate programs in a variety of subjects because our student loans weren't already high enough. In any way, you are following the path for you. There's no exact science behind it. It's your life. Do what you think is best. Graduating is scary. Graduating with an art degree is scary. Graduating with an art degree during a pandemic is terrifying. I would know. I'm graduating next year. (laughs) Regardless, I just want everyone to know that you should follow what you are truly passionate in. Don't listen to the people telling you what to do, what's gonna make the most money, what's gonna do whatever. You do what your heart wants. And I know that sounds cheesy, but I promise I'm telling the truth. That's what I want for you, my lovely viewers. Anyway, thanks for joining me on 34th and Art. Be sure to follow Inside Ambition on Instagram and YouTube for all of the latest. I'll see you right here at the same address next week. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the DAC Recap, the show where we recap all things Drexel, and Philadelphia sports. As always, I am your host, Luciano Duffy. Make sure you like and subscribe below. Now, let's jump right into it. Ladies and gentlemen, the eagle has landed. What eagle is that you may be wondering? Newly hired Eagles head coach Nick Sereni has officially landed in Philadelphia to take over Doug Peterson's old team. Sereni started his NFL career with the Kansas City Chiefs back in 2009. There, he filled multiple roles over multiple years, working mostly with quarterbacks and wide receivers. Next, he moved out west to the then-named San Diego Chargers. Once again, he bounced around multiple positions, but ultimately worked primarily with the wide receivers and quarterbacks. His last stop was in Indianapolis, where he worked as the offensive coordinator under former Eagles offensive coordinator, Frank Wright. At 39 years old, 
Sereni brings a new, young energy to the building. He becomes the first Italian-American Eagles head coach. South Philly stand up. Philadelphia has a new Italian stallion in town. His past work with wide receivers and quarterbacks bodes well for the Eagles as these two positions are the Eagles' biggest weaknesses on the offensive side of the ball. Reports also indicate that Sereni is a player's coach. However, he won't baby any players. Watch out, Carson Wentz. Maybe you won't get an extra scoop of ice cream after practice. Sereni's biggest flaw is that he's never called plays before. Sereni decided to employ Jonathan Gannon and Shane Steichen to be his defense and offensive coordinators. Gannon met Sereni in Indianapolis as he was the defensive backs coach there since 2018. He has also spent time with the Falcons, Titans, and Vikings coaching staffs. With all of these Italian Colts coaches coming to the Eagles, the real question becomes, should the Eagles straight up rename themselves the Italian Colts? Or maybe, even better yet, they become the Indianapolis Spaghetti and Meatballs. How about that for a team name? Steichen, on the other hand, met Sereni when the two of them coached in San Diego. Steichen spent eight out of his nine years in the NFL with the Chargers, where he was able to climb up the ladder from QB coach all the way up to offensive coordinator. Be on the lookout for any Colts or Chargers free agents and trades coming to the Eagles in the near future. Who do you think the Eagles are going to sign in free agency? Down at the Wells Fargo, the Sixers have been on fire so far in this young season. Thanks to a monster start from center Joel Embiid, the Sixers have the best record in the East at 12-5. So far, Embiid is averaging 27.7 points and 11.5 rebounds, which is good enough for 5th and 7th in the league, respectfully. With two 40-point games over the last two weeks, Embiid has been playing some of the best basketball of his career and clearly cementing himself into the MVP conversation. MV Bede 2021, anyone? Guard Danny Green and center Dwight Howard came to the Sixers with some new hardware as they both won rings last year with the Lakers. The Sixers were also able to acquire Seth Curry from the Dallas Mavericks, and he has been deadly from downtown, leading the league in three-point percentage shooting 56% from behind the arc. Now that the trade rumors around Ben Simmons are over, he can continue to ball out for the Sixers and hopefully bring the team a Larry O'Brien trophy for the first time since 1983. Staying in the Wells Fargo Center, the Flyers have also been hot to start the season. They swept their cross-state rivals, the Penguins, to start the year. They have since cooled off but still hold third place in the East at a 3-2-1 record. Fingers are being pointed in lots of different directions following the Flyers' two-game losing skid. Media and fans are questioning the forward depth, defensive flaws, and inconsistent goalie play. The Flyers are visibly frustrated as post-game antics have become childish. Players are fighting with the goals, with sticks after games, and arguing with reporters in press conferences. Hopefully, the Flyers can get back on track as they have multiple matchups with the New Jersey Devils and New York Islanders, two historically bad hockey teams. In the meantime, Flyers fans can enjoy this fan-made female version of Gritty. How about that for a costume? The Phillies have added pitching help. I repeat, the Phillies have added pitching help. While it's just one pitcher on a one-year deal, this is a huge step in the right direction. The man they signed is Archie Bradley. This $6 million deal doesn't break the bank and adds some much-needed pitching to the Phillies' rotation. Bradley has spent the majority of his five-year career on the Arizona Diamondbacks, 
with little time spent on the Cincinnati Reds towards the end of 2020. Bradley was excellent down the stretch for the Reds and has experience pitching in a variety of roles out of the bullpen. He posted a 2.95 ERA and a 2 to nothing record before getting non-tendered. Now, let's hope the, the Phillies grab some more bullpen help and find a way to bring back JT Romerito. Hold up. Another breaking news report? JT Romero has signed with the Phillies. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been covering the Phillies since last year, and this move is the biggest move the Phillies have made. Welcome home, JT Romerito. We're lucky to have you for the next five years. Drexel's men's and women's basketball teams were the only two sports to start back up this winter season. Both teams have gone off to great starts as the boys team sits at 7-5 and five, while the girls team sits at 7-4. and four. Both teams will be playing Northeastern this weekend in the Battle of the Co-Ops. Let's go Dragons! That's all for the DAC recap this week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram. Tune in next week for another recap. Hi, welcome back to Drexel Update. My name is Emily McAndrews and today we're going to be speaking with Juliana Walgren, the president of Drexel Newman Catholic Community. Hi Juliana, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, so I guess let's just start off, um, tell us a little bit about you and what your role is um, in the organization. So about me personally, my name is Juliana. I am an electrical engineering major, a pre-junior right now. I'm also minoring in green energy and sustainability as well as history. Um, my role within the organization, so I'm the president of Drexel Newman. Um, Drexel Newman is just kind of like the Catholic presence on the campus at Drexel. So my role is more just kind of an organizational oversight thing. I make sure that everyone feels comfortable in um, coming to our events or just hanging out. I make sure that everyone who's organizing things has the support that they need to do their jobs. Um, I'm just kind of there to encourage everyone to, to be friends and, and to be unified and to work well together. Amazing. Um, really glad that you guys kind of have that sense of, uh, you know, community. Um, so I guess what are some special things that you guys typically do around campus? Um, you know, obviously when we're in a little more of a normal world. Um, yes, yeah, so just an overview of what we do. So something that we do is every Tuesday night, um, we usually have mass and then we have a Newman night, we call it. So we'll have a speaker come in to talk about all different topics. Sometimes it's a student, sometimes it's someone we bring in from outside. Sometimes we just do a game night or we'll just have food, kind of like have a party, kind of, you know, it depends week to week what we want to do. So that's something that we do every single Tuesday night. Obviously, we've kind of had to shift things virtual because of the pandemic, but I really enjoyed that. That used to be in the academic building, um, which is like right across the street from Bentley now. And that was really fun because we have a chapel in there, so that's where we'd have mass. Um, other stuff that we do is we have an Ash Wednesday mass every year. Um, so Ash Wednesday is usually sometime like end of February, early March, it changes every year. So we'll usually have a really big mass for that. Sometimes it's in Bissone, um, just kind of, and it's on campus. So it's a cool because a lot of people who we don't usually see will come to that, um, which is really nice. We also do a bunch of different welcome week events. Um, my favorite is something called the lock-in. So it's a little bit later. It's the Saturday at the end of welcome week, or sorry, at the end of week one. Um, and we invite everyone to our Newman Center, which is attached to the church that we usually go to, which is St. Agatha St. James at 38th and Chestnut. Um, and we like have this big scavenger hunt all through um, University City and through Center City. Uh, and then we just kind of hang out all night and play games and eat food and it's really fun. Um, and that's what got me involved with Newman. And I've really enjoyed helping run that the past few, couple of years. Um, we don't do a ton of other really, really big events. Um, I would say we also do a um, a mass on like the move-in Sunday. Um, so we sometimes will get a lot of freshmen come to that. Um, and then we'll just do other events through the year. Um, but so those are some of the really big ones. That's great. Um, you know, it seems like you definitely have like found a way to really kind of do as much as you can. And it's really great for people, um, you know, to find a, a place like that when they come away to school. Um, I know a lot of times, sometimes people might have a hard time finding, you know, things that, you know, that remind them a home or things like that. So I think it's awesome that you guys do a lot of things like that. Um, 
So I guess to touch a little bit more on, like, for example, the Ash Wednesday mask, I know, you know, obviously that's a big deal, and that's, you know, going to be coming up um, in the near future. Um, you know, how does that how does that look different this year for you guys? Yeah, so that's something we're still figuring out. Last <laughs> year, we uh, it was, like, one of the very last things we got to do before the pandemic, so it's one of the few things that we haven't already done um, during COVID. We're probably, so the church, we're not like affiliated with the church, like they do their own things and we just kind of go to their masses. So they're still going to have Ash Wednesday mass. Um, so most likely we'll just say, listen, if you're interested in going to Ash Wednesday mass, the church is having it. Um, as of right now, we haven't really solidified any plans. Obviously it's unlikely that we'll be able to have a, a, you know, a big mass in Drexel's auditorium. Um, although we'll work with Drexel's administration to see if there's you know anything we can do. But I'm thinking this year it'll kind of be like, Maybe we'll do like an online talk or something, but we don't have plans to have a big on-campus mass. Well, I hope you guys get that together. Um, I know that that's, uh, you know, you guys usually have a nice turnout for that. So I hope that you guys are able to get that same thing, um, you know, whether it's online or maybe in person or however it turns out. Um, what to you, um, like, what do you think is kind of the best part about your organization? Um, you're obviously very close and, Everyone's kind of really involved. So what's kind of one of the special things that really drew you to the organization and kind of continues to bring people back and keep them in? Um, for me, it was definitely the community, which I know a lot of orgs, like they also have community. So it's it's something that, you know, is really special for any student organization. But I don't know, for me, it's, it's really nice because a lot of the people who come to Drexel Newman are, we're already Catholic or grew up Catholic or went to Catholic school or something. And we have some people who just show up and have no affiliation. They're like, oh, I'm interested in learning. Um, but for a lot of them, like, there's just so many shared experiences. Or I could be like, oh, like, you know, when you were growing up, like, did you guys do this at your church? Or, oh, you know, like, I went to Catholic school too. Like, you know, like, remember like this kind of like funny thing that we all used to do. So it's really nice to have that like kind of shared experience to draw on because it's so easy to just like, I could meet someone brand new who I've like never talked to before and we could just fall right into a conversation. Um, and then of course, yeah, there are people who they don't have any of those experiences and it's just great to welcome them in and see what their experiences have been and, and kind of share in that. But for me, definitely the community and how easy it just feels to be able to talk to people. That's a great thing to find on campus for sure. Um, so if anyone's interested in getting involved um, with Newman, how can they, how can they find you guys? Um, so, I mean, I would say right now the easiest way is probably online. We're on Dragon Link um, as Drexel Newman Catholic Community. If you aren't a big Dragon Link person, which I know not everyone is, um, we're also on most social media. So, we're on Instagram as Dragon Catholic. Um, although, if you search up Drexel Newman, it should also come up. We're also on Facebook. Um, and we send out a weekly email. So, in order to get on that, you'd have to like get on our Dragon Link. But we send out an update every single week with what we've got going on. Um, or other opportunities through the church or through Penn Newman, um, just ways to get involved. So I definitely would recommend either Instagram, Facebook, or Dragon Link. Um, and if we're back in camp, we're back on campus, you can just come find us on the second floor of the academic building. All right. Well, thank you so much, Juliana. I'm really glad that we were able to talk about, uh, you know, talk to you today, talk a little bit about your organization. Um, you guys definitely bring the community here on campus. Um, and so I'm really excited to see what you guys are able to do um, this year as we continue to move online and eventually in person. So kind of seeing what you guys are able to do um, and how much you've still been able to do um, in this time. It's great. So I'm really glad that I was able to speak with you today. I really enjoyed it too. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Um, so have a good one. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks for watching Drexel Update. Uh, you guys can find all of the Drexel Newman Catholic Community information in the description below. Make sure that you guys go ahead and like this video and subscribe to the YouTube channel so that way you can see all of this content and many more. And of course, follow us on Instagram at inside underscore ambition. Subscribe to our channel if you are a Drexel student or Drexel alum. Drexel parents, I'm so sorry, but you're not going to be able to find out what your child is up to through me. Just shut your laptop and give them a call. Oh, before you go, subscribe!